Hey Bruce, it's Maru. I know it's been a while. I'm reaching out to you for a favor. Okay, not really a favor, but more like a request. Back in the day as your client, I always counted on you for making things big. I need a presenter who can really get the crowd cheering, on their feet, clapping, wanting more. Okay, if that was the case, I guess I should have called a rock star. But aren't you kind of like the rock star in the advertising world, right? Mr. Bruce Turkel, featured on Fox, CNN, and Fast Company, speaker at MIT, TED and Harvard, a regular branding hero. Okay, maybe hero is too strong. How about expert? <laughs> okay, seriously speaking, I want everyone to hear a new approach to our business, a fresh outlook on how to be innovative. Formats are constantly evolving, and we want to engage our viewers, not just offer them options. S&P has the privilege to work with various teams throughout Turner, and we don't take this lightly. Okay, now that I've officially written the longest email in Turner Media Plus history, let me know if you want to do this. Oh yeah, and just as equally as important, are you available November 2nd to fly to the Bahamas? Condition? As long as I can wear this cool new outfit to Turner's Junk New Night. <laughs> no! What? Too much? Introducing to the stage, Mr. Bruce Turkel. Straighten it out. Straighten it out. Got to straighten it out. Can you, can you believe after all that, Madhu did not let me wear the Superman outfit? I can't tell you how disappointed I am. But let me just talk to you for a minute about what would have happened if this conference was put on about three years ago. I would have stood up here and said to you, next year, the United States will have an African-American president. If you all were tweeting, you would have tweeted three letters, WTF. You all know what that stands for, I assume? OK. And then if I had said, let's talk about the economy for a minute, and I would have talked about how our incredibly soaring businesses and our values and our real estate was all of a sudden going to just disappear, you would have written, WTF? If I would have told you all the changes that have happened, how about the fact that there is now a free media network called the internet, and people can watch shows for free whenever they want? Would, would that have gotten a WTF from you? Absolutely. WTF, WTF, WTF. So I thought, well, I ought to know what WTF means. It does not, by the way, stand for Wisconsin Tourism Federation. They found that out. They had to change their name. It does not stand for Williamsburg Theater Fund. It stands for something very different. But before we get into it, because this is a family organization after all, I want to tell you a story of how I learned about this. And this goes back about 12 years. When the Internet 1.0 was out, you probably remember Internet 1.0, although it wasn't called 1.0 because we didn't know there was going to be a 2.0. We were doing lots of work in the internet space. And so I was in an organization called the Internet Advertising Alliance. And I used to fly to San Francisco once a month for these meetings. And it's, it's interesting to me, and I don't think it's a coincidence, that the rise of the internet and the rise of Starbucks happened together. So in this group, there were all these kids who didn't shave and drank lots of Starbucks, which meant they were vibrating all the time. And they were talking about this new technology and how it was going to change the world. And then I was in this group trying to figure out what was going on. And then there was an older guy who had a beard and he wore a tweed jacket and had the little elbow patches on it. He looked very professorial and he never said a word. He just took notes. And these meetings would go on month after month and the jittery kids would talk about all this exciting stuff that was happening. And of course, they weren't tweeting back then, but they had, if you remember, Palm Pilots, right? And they were writing stuff in their Palm Pilots, and they were always real nervous. And this other guy never said a word. He just took notes. He just took notes. And then one day there was an argument, and they were talking about the future of the Internet. And all these kids were saying what they thought was going to happen with the Internet. And finally, the old man said something, and the kids went nuts. They started yelling at him. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't even use the internet. You don't understand it. And he said, do you know what I do for a living? Of course, none of them knew because none of them bothered to ask because none of them cared. Do you know what I do for a living? He says, I'm a historian. Well, you can imagine how they rolled their eyes when they heard that. I'm a historian. 
I study the past. And so I know exactly what's going to happen. Well, the kids were floored. How can this guy know what's going to happen? He knows nothing about technology. He says, I study fads. I study booms and busts. And I've studied things from the tulip frenzy in the 1600s in the Netherlands. I've studied the discovery of Asia by Europe. I've discovered, I've, I've covered the, uh, the discovery of the new world. I've watched booms and busts, the, the depression in the 1920s, real estate booms and busts. And I know exactly what's going to happen. He says, I don't know when it's going to happen, and I don't know how it's going to happen, but I know exactly what's going to happen, because human beings are destined to repeat the future, over, I mean, to repeat the past, over and over and over. And it dawned on me some years later, thinking about this guy, that everything he said was right. The internet 1.0 blew up just like he said it would. It happened exactly like he said he would, because he understood the past. And it dawned on me further that WTF does not stand for what the, but it stands instead for where's the future. And if we want to figure out what we're going to do with our companies, if we want to understand where we're going to move our businesses, then we need to understand WTF, where's the future. So taking a lesson from this historian, I thought, well, to figure out the future, we need to go to the past. So I want you all to go on a little trip with me. And you have, magically, right in front of you, your own Turner Media Plus time machine. It's invisible, but there's two knobs. And I want you to set the knob on the left-hand side to 1747, OK? Can you do it? OK, look, if I'm up here making a fool of myself, you all can do it, OK? Gretchen, would you lead the group, please? OK, so you're setting it, all right? OK, now the right hand, I want you to set the location. We're going to Leipzig, Germany, OK? And make sure you get it right, because you don't want to wind up in the wrong place, because then you won't get to come with the rest of us. Now, if you watch um, your vintage movie channel, if you're watching TMC, you probably know how this time machine works. We set the knobs, and then we go like this. Poof, we're back in time, OK? So on the count of three, and please participate, one, two, three. Perfect. You see how it worked? So we are in Leipzig, Germany, 1740. We're going to meet with a man by the name of Johann Sebastian Bach. All of you heard of him? Raise your hand. All right. First of all, let's have a ground rule. This means yes. This means no. This is what the dinosaurs did in Jurassic Park, OK? So none of this. So who's heard of Johann Sebastian Bach? Raise your hand. Thank you. Now, Johann Sebastian Bach, as you probably know, we've never seen photographs of him, but we've seen pictures. He was a little short guy. He had that long gray wig. He wore that sort of red velvet pilgrim outfit with the funny shoes. And he was a composer. Well, he was a composer later on in his life. When he started his career, he was a piano teacher. Well, he wasn't even a piano teacher because pianos had not yet been invented. He was actually a spinet teacher. And a spinet is a miniature piano, and a lot of what he wrote that later on became these incredible compositions were actually pieces that he wrote to teach his students how to play. And one of his most famous pieces of music is called Minuet in G. If you have children who have taken piano lessons, you've heard it. How many of you, remember this means yes, how many of you have children who have taken piano lessons? Keep your hands up. How many of you have children? How many of you know what children are? OK, so you're paying attention. So, it's crucial to me that you understand Minuet and G, because this portends the future, this piece of music. And so I had asked the organizers to have a baby grand piano here for me, but there were two problems. First of all, it's really hard to get a baby grand piano up onto the stage. And second of all, I don't play the piano. But neither did Johann Sebastian Bach. He played the spinet, which is a miniature spinet, so I thought, I mean, a miniature piano, so I thought, well, I'll bring a miniature spinet. It looks like this, and I'm going to play Minuet and G. And it sounds like this. Thank you. Kind of like Nicholas with the guitar, don't you think? 
So Minuet and G, Johann Sebastian Bach. We have that firmly planted in our minds. Take out your, your uh, time machine again. We're going from 1740, two clicks, to 1940. We're going from v uh, Leipzig, Germany, a couple clicks to Vicksburg, Mississippi. Ready? One, two, three. I love this front row. Thank you. And now we're going to meet with a guy by the name of Sonny Boy Williamson. Now, Sonny Boy was about as different from Johann Sebastian Bach as you can be. Johann Sebastian Bach was short. Sonny Boy Williamson was six foot six. Johann Sebastian Bach, I told you, wore that sort of red velvet Eddie Munster suit. Sonny Boy Williamson wore all black, English wool suits in the heat of the summer. Sonny Boy had a, a black bowler cap. Um, Johann Sebastian Bach wore that wig. But they were both composers, and they both wrote lots of music that you're familiar with. And Sonny Boy wrote a piece of music that you've also heard. It's called Peachy Tree, and it sounds like this. <laughs> of those guys were about as different as different can be. Both of those pieces of music are about as different as different can be. But they both use exactly the same seven notes. And if you remember the sound of music, you know the seven notes. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, <clears throat> ti. And yeah, there's do, but do, do, it's an octave. It's the same note. There's only seven notes. Every piece of Western music ever written uses those same seven notes. So as we try to figure out where is the future, where are we going to move our business, how are we going to market, how are we going to sell, sell, sell our customers, as I heard said a couple times in the last presentation, what we need to understand is that we're working with the same tools as everybody else. We just have to look at things a different way. So I want to take you on another little trip and another story and tell you about a guy by the name of John von Neumann. Now, von Neumann was the best mathematician of his generation. And between the First World War and the Second World War, he was brought to the United States from Hungary. He worked with Albert Einstein at the, Princeton, at the Advanced Research Group in Princeton. And this is where these guys would come up with these incredible theories of physics and string theory and fractals and all this crazy stuff that we still don't understand today. But during World War II, von Neumann was called on a secret mission, a top secret mission, to England. And he was secreted to England, and he went to an air base. And one of the air marshals took him outside and explained what the mission was. What he explained was that, that the American Air Force was using these B-29s, those giant bombers. If you've watched the World War II movies, you've seen them, those enormous bombers that were going to fly over the English Channel, over the North Sea, and into Europe on bombing raids. But the problem was the distances were so great, the planes were so heavy, that they could only put enough fuel in them to just get there and just get back. And so when the Luftwaffe, when the German Air, Air Force, sent up their planes, these giant planes had no defenses. So the Air Marshal explains all of this to von Neumann and takes him out to a field where there were hundreds of B-29 bombers. And each one of them was marked up with a yellow or a red mark. And the Air Marshal explains that each one of these planes has been marked where it was hit by shrapnel. Yellow meant shrapnel from an airplane, red meant shrapnel from the ground to air um, defenses that the Germans used. And he says, what we need to figure out is where these planes are vulnerable. Because we can't armor the planes, it'll make them too heavy, and yet American servicemen are dying in the North Sea because the planes can't get back. And you were the best mathematician of your time, and we need you to figure out where we should armor these planes. So von Neumann walks into the field, and he looks at the first plane, and he looks at the second plane, and he looks at the third plane. And it took him the better part of a day because the field was full of planes as far as the eye could see. Von Neumann looked at every single one. And he walks back. The air marshal comes out. The air marshal says to him, so did you solve the problem? And von Neumann, who is also, from what I understand, a rather egotistical guy, says, yes, of course I solved the problem. So the air marshal says, well, what do we do? Where do we armor these planes? And von Neumann walks over to one of them, 
and he puts his hand on the plane's flank. But the spot where he puts his hand is like this paper. There's nothing on it. It's completely blank. And the air marshal looks at that, and then he looks at every other plane. And he notices that in the exact spot where von Neumann placed his hand, there's not a yellow mark, and there's not a red mark. And the air marshal, what he exactly said has been lost to history, but you can assume that it was very profane and it wasn't very nice. But he yells at him, he says, we bring you all this way. I'm told you're the smartest mathematician alive. I'm telling you that American servicemen are dying in the, in the North Sea. And you tell me to armor my planes where not one of them has been hit? And von Neumann says very quietly, but sir, these are the planes that made it back. And so when we look to figure out how do we do this, where's the future, what we have to realize is the planes we're looking at, they're the ones that came back. That's not the solution. The solution has to be somewhere else. The solution has to be in a place that a good friend of mine calls hidden in plain sight. The answers are there. It's just a matter of seeing them. And the way we see them is to look at them differently. One of the treats for me for coming to uh, Paradise Island is that I have a very good friend, two friends actually, who live here. And I want to tell you a little bit about them because they're incredibly successful because they've figured out how to look at what's not there, how to see what's hidden in plain view. One of my friends has created a business, an investing business, where they lo he looks at situations in the world, whether it's stocks, commodities, currencies, I don't understand any of it. But what he explained to me was he looks for opportunities that other people don't see. The opportunities that all of us could see, but we simply don't. They're there. They're right in front of our eyes. But he profits from them, and we don't. His wife was looking at another problem, education, and how to provide better education. And instead of looking at the educational system, as most educators do, she looked at what would education be called on to accomplish? Where's the future? And what she realized was, if we are in a global world, if we are in a connected world, if the world is getting smaller day by day, then we need global leaders who understand the world. If that's the case, how can we train students in a little classroom, in a little box, when they're going to have to be the people who are going to change this new interconnected world? So she created a school called the Think Global School, where instead of students going to school, Students go to different countries, and right now they're in Stockholm, and they're studying history, and they're studying math, and they're studying literature, but they're studying the history, math, and literature of Northern Europe. And when they study history, they go to the spots where the history occurred. And when they study literature, they read books that were written by authors who lived in these spots. So they live it. They understand it. She's changing the entire educational system of the world simply by looking at what's there and then seeing what's not there, and figuring out how do we make that change. And before you tell me, yeah, but that's too hard. That's too hard. How am I supposed to do that? Let me tell you about an idea that you see every single day, right in front of your eyes. Think about how often you see somebody going by with a walker. You know those walkers. Older people tend to use them for stability. Who can tell me the odd? unique, common thing about these walkers that you notice? Anyone? Tennis balls. Exactly right. Every walker has tennis balls on the bottom of it. Everybody's seen that, right? Now, why do you think the walkers have tennis balls? Do you think old people love tennis balls? Do you think they say, you know, this walker is just too damn gray, but if it had some fluorescent yellow at the bottom, then it'd be a chick magnet. Or maybe you think they're running around like trying to poke tennis balls? I mean, think about it. Where do the old people get the tennis balls from in the first place? Does your grandmother have tennis balls laying around her house? And how do they cut them? And how do they stick them on? Well, if every single person using a walker has got tennis balls on them, why haven't the tennis ball, I mean, the walker companies figured out to put something on the bottom of these things? There's an opportunity that passes you every single day. Think about it. The bottom of each one of those walkers is a patent waiting to be filed. It's an invention waiting to be created. It's a demand waiting to be met. It's a sale to an audience waiting to be sold. And yet we watch it go by, and we don't take advantage of it. 
because we don't see things that are hidden in plain sight. Just to let you know, I have not patented this idea. So you have, unless someone wants to run out and do it now, you have a little while to go outside and, and, and submit your patent. One of you can own this one because there's another one coming along tomorrow. Now, how do we figure this out? How do we understand how to change our business? And I'll show you. Most of us are too concerned with the content of our businesses. Most of us are thinking all the time about content. Content. The videos that we've seen up on this screen, content. The things that you sell to your, um, to your audience, content. Uh, Nicholas Negroponte wrote Being Digital, said, content is king. We're all busy thinking about content. But then let's think about what happens when we think about content. Think about a different media business. Think about the newspaper business. There's a business that's in trouble, right? Newspapers. Why are they in so much trouble? Because they focus on content. And in their case, the content, the problem, is that they have the word paper in their name. News paper. And they focus on paper. So they ship paper, and they print paper, and they deliver paper, and in some cases they recycle paper. All of a sudden, we're in a new, a new community, a new electronic digital community. We don't need the paper. We can get the newspaper on our phones. We can get it on our iPads. We can get it on our computers. They've been focusing on paper, and now paper is irrelevant. But what if they had focused on something different? What if they had focused? on the news? What if they had focused on the first part of their name, news? So instead of selling the paper, 25 cents for something in paper, but free if you get it online, they sold the news. Now you might say, well, that's the content. And then think about what you sell. Cartoon Network, you have content in the name. Boomerang, CNN, TNT, M um, Warner, all your different channels, iSpec, all of them. Think about it. It's all about content. And yet, what are your consumers, not the viewers, but your consumers, the people who spend money with you, what are they buying? They're buying something very different. And this is what's changed. This is what has changed all of our businesses. And this is what I believe the world is waiting to catch up with. They have to understand that the world has changed. John Lennon said, life is what happens when you're busy doing other things. And that's what happened. While we were busy doing other things, the world changed. So I had clients who would say to me a few years ago, you know what, we just bought a Macintosh. We don't need you guys anymore. Because they were concentrating on content. To which I would reply, hey, I got a piano at home. It doesn't mean I can play it. Having content and having the tools of content does not mean you're creating something that consumers want to buy. We go back to those three letters, WTF. Where's the future? And let me suggest that it's in one letter right here. Instead of content, what we all need to care about is context. We all need to understand where our businesses matter in the lives of our consumers. Where is the context within which we live? Look at the automobile business. When automobiles were first invented, they were not used as transportation. They were too expensive, they were too delicate, and there was nowhere to drive them. There were no roads that were appropriate, and there certainly were no service stations. So back then, automobiles were kind of like jet skis are. They were fun, they were expensive, you would take them out for a ride, and then you would come back. It was an activity. It wasn't, a transp it wasn't transportation. About 50 years after the automobile was invented, and by the way, invented by Daimler or Peugeot, there's still or Renault, there's still arguments about who actually invented it. But 40 to 50 years later, a man by the name of Henry Ford revolutionized the industry because he did not concentrate on content, meaning this device that can go from here to here. Instead, he concentrated on context. Henry Ford talked about what can people do with this car that can change their lives. Henry Ford said, if I asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And it dawned on him all of a sudden, they weren't thinking of cars as transportation, they were thinking of cars as toys. WTF for sure. And he figured out how to make assembly lines so the price of cars could come down. He figured out how to make assembly lines so one piece could fit in any car 
so you could repair them. He changed and created an entire industry because he thought about context. How about closer to your business, a man by the name of Bruce McGaw. Bruce McGaw inherited his father's company. He and his brothers ran a company that was involved in the cell phone business, or actually phones before cell phones. But as he understood cell phones, it dawned on him that cell phones, the reason they're called cells, as you know, is because the signal goes from cell to cell, that if people wanted to make transcontinental cell phone calls, they needed a way to connect those phones. And it dawned on him that the way to do it was to use the tops of mountains. And so he researched the highest traffic patterns in the United States from the highest areas of demographic in, um, intensity. So from New York to LA, from New York to Chicago, how could you connect those areas? And what he found were the mountain ranges that went between those areas. He leased the tops of mountains. Now, those tops of mountains had no value. Nobody cared about them. He leased them from the federal government and he put up antennas so that these cell calls could be made from mountain to mountain to mountain. You all know the nursery rhyme. The bear went over the mountain, the bear went over the mountain, the bear went over the mountain. And what do you think he saw? He saw another mountain, right? That's the, that's the nursery rhyme. But somehow, Magog didn't see another mountain. He saw something that was right there for all of us to see, but nobody noticed it. And he created Magog Cellular, which he sold to AT&T for $2.2 billion. Now, true, he had to share that $2.2 billion with his two brothers. But it's now worth over $6 billion because he saw something that the rest of us didn't see. So then the question becomes, if the answers are there and we need to train ourselves to look at them differently, how do we do that? And I would suggest to you that one of the ways is to look at artists. Because artists, good artists, understand that their work is about content, it is about technique, it is about the ability to sculpt or paint or write or sing or dance. But more importantly, it's about context. So for example, Pablo Picasso took a bicycle seat and a set of handlebars And he put them together, and he put them on a wall, and he created art. And some people look at that and say, that's not art, that's just junk. He took two pieces of junk and he put them on a wall. And some people, the people who think about content, think the only reason that this is valuable is because Pablo Picasso did it. And if you or I did it, it wouldn't be valuable. But if you think about context, what was Picasso saying? Well. He created this after an enormous shift in the Spanish population, because three things happened in Spain. There was a, the Spanish Civil War, there was World War I, and there was one of the worst, most virulent influenza epidemics in the history of the world. And Spain lost an enormous portion of its population in just a few years. And Spain, which had been an agrarian community, had to become an urban community because people needed to go where there were jobs. And what was the symbol of Spain? It was the bull, el toro. And the bull, a bull head, talked about manhood, machismo. It was food. It was transportation. It was sport. It was glory. And Picasso, with two pieces of junk, showed how Spanish civilization had changed. Because now, Spanish civilization, which had been before the icon was the bull head, now it was a bicycle seat because Spanish civilization became urban and industrialized almost overnight. And if you look at it from a contextual point of view, if you were in business then you would realize, wait a second, we have to move our businesses. We can't continue to sell tractors and things in the farmlands. We got to move into the cities and sell things. That would have been your symbol. And then maybe 50 years later, a man by the name of Andy Warhol came along and he took a can of, pa of Campbell's soup tomato soup, and he put it on a canvas, and he called it art. And people looked at that art and they said, that's not art, that's junk. He just took a can of soup and he put it on a canvas. But what was Andy Warhol saying contextually? What had happened in the United States? Well, during World War II, all the men were shipped off to Europe or shipped off to Asia. 
to fight in the war. And women could no longer stay home. Women went and worked. And so when men came back, some of them, you know the old saying, it's hard to keep them on the farm after they've seen Paris, talking about the servicemen who came back. But it's also hard to get women who had had rather servile lives beforehand, now had been out in the workplace, to get them to go back to the kitchen didn't make sense. And the world changed. The United States changed almost overnight. What was the icon of that change? One of the things that went away was cooking. Because women used to be in the kitchen, and they cooked, and soup was something that came from vegetables and the heart. And now, soup came from a can. So Andy Warhol was saying that what used to be art what used to be love is now mechanized. And if we were paying attention, if we understood that this is where ideas come from, then we would have said, wait a second, there's going to be this enormous revolution, and women are going to be driving, and they're going to be working, and they're going to need different clothes. And there's an enormous business there, if we were paying attention to context. And so then you could say to me, yeah, but that's art. I want to talk about business. We are business people in this room. I want to talk about business. And so let's look at business, shall we? Think about context. What is Google any more than a couple guys saying, hey, where did I leave my keys? But in a global sense. Google is taking an old thing, I need to find something, and something new, the internet, and putting it together. What is eBay? eBay is just a flea market or a bazaar combined with the internet. It's the world's newest business, the internet, combined with the world's oldest business. OK, combined with the world's second oldest business. And you create eBay. And all of a sudden, when you do that, the world changes. How about YouTube? Think about, a few years ago, your concerns about on-air production was all about resolution, the quality of resolution. When was the last time you heard anybody complain about the resolution of a video on YouTube? And the resolution sucks. But consumers don't care, because in context, in context, it works within their lives. Let me show you another example. In Germany, there are five car companies. There's Opel, there's Mercedes-Benz, there's BMW, there's Volkswagen, and there's Audi. They all manufacture exactly the same thing. They all make cars. And if you look at their entry-level cars, you have the um, Opel Senator, the Mercedes C-Class, the BMW 3 Series, the Volkswagen Passat, and the Audi A4, they are all within one inch of each other in height, in length, in wheelbase. They weigh the same. They look the same. If you were in one and you were blindfolded, well, and hopefully you weren't driving, you can't even tell the difference. But the car companies need you to tell the difference. So right on the front, right between the headlights, they put a logo. They all use circles. Opel's logo is a lightning bolt. It looks like that. Mercedes-Benz logo, it's a peace sign. It looks like that. But look at the logo closer for a minute. Opel divides their circle in half. Mercedes-Benz divides their circle into thirds. BMW, the ultimate driving machine, they divide their circle into quarters. Volkswagen, all they did was take the Mercedes logo and turn it over, and then they removed the vertical and they replaced it with a W. And then the guys from Audi came along. They didn't know what to do. They said, the heck with it. They just took the other guy's circles. <laughs> so even the logos are exactly the same. But the cars are very different, aren't they? What, is, what does a Mercedes-Benz stand for? Luxury, good. What else? I'm sorry? Liability? Oh, reliability, of course. Thank you. Reliable, good. What else? Performance, Performance very good. How about the one that no one ever wants to say? Safety, Safety okay. And? They're expensive. So, a Mercedes Benz is expensive, safe, luxurious, reliable, and high performance. Yes? Do we agree? Yes. Remember, this means yes. Thank you. OK. Now, a BMW, expensive? Sure. Safe? Luxurious? Reliable? 
high performance. So a BMW is exactly the same as a Mercedes-Benz, right? But, but BMW is actually one more thing, or one thing that they really, really pay attention to. And what is that? Performance, exactly. BMW is all about performance. Now, here's where the context, the context of a brand becomes critical. And here's where the profits are in branding your signals and in building loyalty with your consumers. The attributes of the brand become the attributes of the consumer. So a Mercedes-Benz is expensive, safe, luxurious, reliable, and high performance. A Mercedes-Benz driver, a Mercedes-Benz owner is affluent, concerned about safety, is a luxurious, status-conscious individual, is a reliable, hard-working person, probably, and high performance because they can afford the car. And a BMW driver is all those things, but tends to be a little bit younger, a little bit sportier, a little bit trendier. In fact, the demographics for BMW drivers fit under the letters PDB, which ironically does not stand for people driving BMWs. It stands for people dressed in black. Because you know all the cool, hip trendsetters Wear black. Those are the people who suck their cheeks in in vogue. You know, you know who they are, and they're wearing, they're wearing, they're driving BMWs. Think about it. In this country, how many BMWs do you see that are not black, blue, or dark gray? Almost none. Because BMWs have a certain image, but that image becomes the image of the consumer. We used to say you are what you eat. We now say you are what you consume. The brand context becomes the consumer context. Think about this for a minute. All of these companies have these logos that they want you to believe in. And so they need to do something to make you believe in them. And so they put them on every single product that they have. But think about what happens with technology in today's world. In technology in today's world, everything gets smaller. So if you think about cameras, cameras, for example, were invented right after the uh, American Civil War in the 1860s. And they were enormous. They were, they, were those, um, they were those wagons that people used to travel in. And then cameras got smaller and smaller. You had box cameras and Instamatic cameras and Brownie cameras. Until today, cameras are so small, they're the size of credit cards. They're tiny. We can put them in. In fact, they even fit in our phones. Think about the first cell phone you ever saw. You remember that? No, that one was the first cell phone you ever bought. The first one you ever saw was that box that had a strap and it had the curly cord and if there was a call, I'd have to like stretch it out. In fact, it would have made more sense. The luggage we all have today with the wheels would have been perfect because you could have pulled your phone along and talked on it. But the first one you ever bought was probably that Motorola one called the brick. And why was it called the brick? Because it was the size of a brick. And then they had the mini brick and then they got smaller and smaller, the StarTech and the clamshell. Until today, phones are so small, they have names like Razor and Sliver. And they're so small, they don't even have vowels. Our razor is RZR, and Sliver is SLVR. Phones just get smaller and smaller, but one thing gets bigger, and it's the keys to these cars. Do you remember when a key used to be a flat piece of metal? And if I would have said to you, can I borrow your car? You say, I'll leave the key under the mat. You could do it. Now it'd be like the princess and the pea, right? The key would go like that. Why are the keys to these cars so big? So they don't fit in your pocket. So you put them in front of you. So people can see the logo on the key. Because the car, the content, which is transportation, is irrelevant at this point. The car is all about context, telling the world who you are. What happens when you walk out to one of these cars and you press the button? What does the car do? Yep. It flashes its lights, and what else? It honks the horn. It flirts with you. Think about it. You walk out, you press the button, and the car goes <whistles> Here I am, over here. You have a Jaguar. Right here, you have a Lexus. You're successful. It tells you what you bought, and it tells everybody else around you what you bought. The fact that it's a good car or a bad car is almost irrelevant. It's all about context. It's all about understanding 
where the business fits. And then you speed all this up with what's going on today, and you look at all the businesses. Think about 10 years ago, if you had been in the fax machine business, what a great business you were in, right? Everybody was buying fax machines. When was the last time you bought a fax machine? When was the last time you used a fax machine? That business is gone. And think about when you bought your first fax machine. There is nothing less valuable than one fax machine. Think about the guy who invented it. He came running into his boss. Boss, look what I invented, a fax machine. It can send messages to anybody. And the boss would say, really? Who? Yeah, good point. You need two fax machines. And then you have two fax machines, and it only works if I want to send you a message. But then, little by little, everybody bought a fax machine. And every time one of you bought a fax machine, my fax machine became more valuable, and vice versa. The context, not the content, but the context improved. But then at some point, we don't even need fax machines. We all have them sitting in our offices with that analog line that we all have plugged into our machine because somebody somewhere one day might send us a fax. Think about dealing with your clients. 15, 20 years ago, if you were typing up a proposal and your client says, hey, I need that proposal right away, you say, no problem. I'll pull it out of the typewriter in a few minutes, I'll put it in the mail, and you'll have it in a week. You remember those days? Then FedEx came along. And the client would call you and say, I need my proposal right now. And you say, no problem. I'll pull it out of the typewriter, I'll put it in FedEx, you'll have it tomorrow. Absolutely, positively overnight, right? You'll have it tomorrow. Then fax machines came along. Client calls you and says, I need that proposal. I want to buy those spots. Come on. And you say, no problem. I'll pull it out of my word processor. I'll put it in. I'll go downstairs. I'll put it in the fax machine. You'll have it in 15 minutes. Now the client calls and says, I need that proposal. You say, no problem. It's in my word processor. I'll email it to you. You'll have it in 12 seconds. Where do we go from here? We have to go back in time. Stephen Wright said it. If you put instant coffee in a microwave, you'll go back in time. Because there's nowhere else to speed things up anymore. The context has become so fast that people want it now. And if they don't have it now, they'll press the button. They'll go to a different media. They've become completely media agnostic. It doesn't matter to them where they get the messaging from. It's just a matter of now. I need it now. And there's three words that people keep insisting on. Three words that every business wants, which is faster, better, cheaper. And it used to be, we can give you two of those. If you want it fast and you want it good, it's going to be really expensive. Remember those days? If you want it good and you want it cheap, it's going to take a long time. And if you want it fast and you want it cheap, it's going to suck. That used to be the way it worked. But it doesn't work that way anymore. Faster, cheaper, better. Faster, cheaper, better. That's what people want. And so what have you done for me lately becomes what have you done for me next. Unless you understand context. Because if you understand context, you can figure out, just like Henry Ford did, what's coming next. So you can provide it to your clients. I was called by a company that wanted us to do a brochure. What's a brochure? By, by now, I'm sure you all know that a brochure is content, right? Guy says, we need a brochure. I said, why? He said, because our customers ask for it. I said, why? He said, well, because it, while we're trying to sell them something, they say, hey, do you have a brochure? And we don't have one. I said, well, tell me more about your business. And this was a guy that makes very, very expensive outdoor furniture. And he creates furniture for your back porch, for your backyard. It's extremely expensive. So, Here's what would happen. A person would go into the store, they would pick out what they liked, and then they would get a salesman, and they'd show the salesman what they wanted, and what color they wanted, and what fabric they wanted, and what materials they wanted, and the salesman would type it all up and say to them, great, we can deliver it for you in 10 days, it's going to cost $72,000. Now, I don't know about you, but when I went to buy some stuff from my backyard, I wasn't thinking of spending quite that much money. But nobody wants to act like the poor guy and say to the salesman, oh, what, are you kidding me? That's too much money. So what do we say? You know what? I need to go home and discuss it with my wife. Do you have a brochure? The brochure was the blow off. There was no sale there. The brochure was the ability of me to leave and save face. So I said to this guy, listen, if that's what happens, 
if we design your brochure, then you're going to have a really beautiful, really expensive brochure, and you're going to watch your sales go down. Because you're going to have salespeople who are going to be so proud of these brochures, they're going to want to give them out, and as soon as they do, people are going to leave. The context is, you need a sales program. You don't need things, you don't need content, you need context. You need a sales program, which by the way, is what S&P does, isn't it? Building these programs, showing your customers how these things work, showing them how they make your lives and your businesses better, because it's about context. How many of you, and this is probably a question to the men in the room, how many of you have read the book um, The Art of War by Sun Tzu? Oh, there are some women raising their hands. Because usually it's men, you know, you go into your Anne Rand phase, and then when you come out of your Anne Rand phase, you go into your Asian Japanese phase, and you read that book. Well, Sun Tzu had, had a, a great quote, and he talked about how we produce these solutions. Because what happens is, think back to, think back to the last time you had a meeting where something had to be accomplished. And as soon as the challenge was set, we need to sell X amount, we need to do this, we need to do that, the hands went up, the hands went up right away. Okay, I'll do a bake sale, I'll do a car wash, I'll go down to Argentina, I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. Why? Because we're all type A people. I don't know all of you, but if you're in this room, you're a type A person. And type A people love to do stuff, right? Write it on my list, go do it, do it, do it, do it, cross it off, email it, send it, do it. We all love that, we all love to be busy because it makes us feel good. I'm getting stuff done, I'm getting stuff off my list, I'm productive, I love that. But we, we mistake productivity, I mean activity, with productivity. But Sun Tzu said that tactics without strategy is the sound of failure. Because we're making all this noise and we're doing all this stuff, but we're not actually accomplishing anything. Tactics without strategy is the sound of failure. He also said, by the way, strategy without tactics is the slowest path to success. That means we're planning everything, but we never implement it. That's what they do at universities. They come up with theories, they come up with programs, they write white papers, but they never implement. So the question then becomes, if we know we need to look after context and we know we need to strategy, how do we do it? And I've just got a couple tips, a couple ideas that you all can use that I think can help you find context can help you work with the context that your consumers, your customers, the people who give you money, the people who sell, 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 or who buy, 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 a couple things that'll help you reach them. Number one, I want you all to become oysters. You know oysters, they're those ugly, funny looking shellfish, those mollusks, they live under the ocean. They look, as far as I can tell, exactly, they're just like clams, except clams are smooth and oysters are not. And, you know, there's that expression, happy as a clam, and I suppose it applies to oysters, too. You could be happy as an oyster. You're down there, it's cool, you're mushy on the inside, crunchy on the outside, everybody's happy. And then one tiny, itty-bitty piece of sand gets into your shell. And you're all nice and soft and mushy in there, and that one little tiny, bitty, itty-bitty piece of sand is an irritant, and it makes you very uncomfortable. What does an oyster do? It's got no hands, so it can't pick the sand up and throw it out. It doesn't have a mouth, it can't spit it out. What does the oyster do when a piece of sand gets into the shell? It starts to put material around that, that piece of sand to protect its soft, mushy flesh from that irritating piece of sand. And ultimately, the oyster creates a pearl. And pearls are valuable. So the oyster takes this challenge, the oyster takes this problem, the oyster takes this irritant and creates something wonderful from it. The next time you hear one of your customers come to you with a problem, instead of thinking, oh my God, that woman never stops complaining. That guy never stops bitching. Why do they bother me? Think it like an oyster and realize that that problem is your opportunity to sell. Hidden in plain sight, the solution is right there. All you need to do is look for it. So be an oyster, and number two, you already heard me say this over and over and over, I hope, focus on context. Stop focusing on content. Content is easy. 
We all picture content. Here's what it looks like, here's what it sounds like. If we're in the restaurant business, here's what it tastes like, here's what it smells like. But you don't really go to restaurants to eat, do you? Because you could eat at home or you could eat anywhere else. You go to restaurants to see your friends, to have a romantic dinner, to spend time, to share with your family. It's about context. And when you understand the context of your business, you change your business. Point three, do it yourself. Do it yourself. Used to be, you needed to hire consultants. You needed to hire experts. You needed to hire people to tell you what to do and how to do it. You don't need that anymore. Today we have democratized distribution. How many of you all tweet? How many of you all are on Twitter? Okay, the rest of you who are not, start this afternoon. I'm not suggesting you'll like it. I'm not suggesting you're going to find that it's fun. But you need to understand it. How many of you blog? Okay, the rest of you, I give you till tomorrow. Those of you who are doing it, terrific. And those of you who had your hands up, you could show the others how to do it. You need to start getting the information out there. You need to do it yourself. LinkedIn, Facebook, Foursquare, I don't care which ones you use. I don't care if you write it, if you chisel it on a stone tablet and you float it up the Euphrates on a papyrus raft. If you write it on a baseball and throw it through somebody's window. What I care about is that you start communicating with your audiences on multiple levels. I sit in these meetings and people say to me, well, let me ask you a question. Should we tweet? Should we blog? Should we, um, should we create a program? How about a YouTube channel? Should we do a YouTube channel? Should we buy advertising? Should we be in magazines or newspapers? Should we be on cable? Should we be? And the answer is D, all of the above. You need to get the message out there. But more importantly, you need to do it yourself. You need to understand it. The videos you've seen up here are spectacular because y'all are doing them. When I was invited to come speak and we did that introduction with me in that funny looking Superman outfit, the great thing was that Maru was doing it and Corey was doing it right there. We did it together. We created that thing. Yeah, she had someone filming it and editing it, but we created it right there. We created a bit of content. More importantly, we created a bit of context that I hope said, okay, this is going to be different. This might even be worth paying attention to. Do it yourself. The next point, don't do it yourself. If you read Daniel Pink, In Your Other Mind, he talks about the three A's, automation, Asia, and abundance. And he says, anything you can automate, automate. Anything you can outsource to Asia, outsource it to Asia. Anything you can create in abundance, so there's so much of it that people can just choose from it, do it. If you've read uh, Tim Ferriss, The 4-Hour Workweek, Tim Ferriss talks about how to have virtual digital assistants. People in low income com countries who will do all of your busy work for you. They will write your blog posts. They will update your mailing lists. When you leave conferences like this one and you have that big stack of business cards, you can put it in a scanner or you can put it in an envelope and send it to Malaysia and there's someone there who will input it for you. So on the one hand, do it yourself. On the other hand, don't do it yourself. There's all these services. There's all this businesses, these businesses that are out there set up just to make your lives easier and allow you to do the important stuff, which is two things to think and to interrelate because these networks that you create in these events is more important than anything else because that's where you build the ability to solve your problems, to create the teams, to reach your goals. The next point, social media. The first word of social media is social. Remember that. You all are in the media business. Make your media social. Make your media include people. Make your media engaging. The age of interruptive advertising is over. It's gone. It used to be. I was driving along. I saw a billboard. It interrupted my life. I was reading a magazine. I saw an ad. It interrupted my life. I was watching television. An ad came on. It interrupted my life. Now we can avoid those. We've got DVRs. We can turn the page. Now it's all about engagement. You interrupt me, I'm going in the other direction. I'm not stopping. But the first part of the word social media, the phrase social media, is social. Make your media social. Get people engaged. Get people involved. I loved listening to the talk about Cartoon Network and how you decided we don't have girls. And so now girls are up 31%. That was done by engagement. Someone was able to convince these girls there's something here you want to participate in. And it wasn't done by interrupting their lives. Because we all know between all the media they have right there with their two thumbs, 
they're much too busy to pay attention to you. I can no longer get my daughter to do something I want her to do by interrupting her. The only way I can interrupt her is to take her phone and throw it away. Other than that, I can't, but if I can engage her, if I can get her to participate in what I want to do, or what I want her to do, things change. Make your media social. Don't let the train pass you by. Don't miss this opportunity. The world is changing in ways we never thought possible, and we can all jump on it. We can all change it. First of all, here's a tip. Everyone's familiar with the internet, right? It's going to catch on. I know you're laughing, but I'm serious. This is going to be big. And figure out ways to use it to drive customers to your core product. Because they are going to be watching, tweeting, emailing, Facebooking. And who knows? Facebook may die tomorrow. Twitter may die in a week, but something else is going to come along. Don't miss the train. Jump on it. And the way to do it is to challenge yourself to try something new. Try something new. So that's what I would like to do right now, is I want to do a little experiment with you. I want you all to try something new, something you've never done before, and something that might get you out of your comfort zone a little bit. By the way, speaking of comfort zones, don't forget that tonight at 7.30 is the Junkanoo costume party. Costumes and drinking. Talk about getting out of your, co your comfort zone. But hopefully I will see you all there and I will not be in the Superman outfit. But let's try something new now, just to get you loosened up a little bit for this costume party. So I have assistants at each table, yes? If you all would grab the boxes you have and distribute the gifts, please. You can take them out of the bags. And by the way, they are specifically in the bags so you know they have not been used before. Oh, look at you. You, got, you already know how to do it, right? I will teach you how right now. Okay, everybody got them unwrapped? Does everybody have one? Okay, great. Okay, oh, that's right, that means yes, thank you. Okay, here's what I want you to do. Take your right hand, think about this, don't make me say, no, no, your other right. Okay, take your right hand and put it like that in front of you. Now, take the harmonica, there is a low side and a high side. You're going to cover maybe three or four holes with your mouth, it doesn't matter how many, and you're going to inhale, draw, and it should sound like this. If it sounds like this, you need to turn it over, okay? So, okay. Okay, once you've figured out where the low side is, I want you to place it so the low side is outside your hand. The high side is next to your hand, like that, okay? So the low side is here, high side is here. Okay? Okay, does everybody know where the low side is? So, let's do this. Hold it up to your mouth. On the count of three, just wait a second, I want you to inhale twice. I want you to inhale twice, it should sound like this. Okay? Okay, someone over there, right? Someone over there needs to turn it over? Good, okay. If you hear this, turn it over. You should hear this. Okay, perfect. So, All of you can read music, right? What we're going to do is we're going to play a C chord and then we're going to... No, you can't read music? All right. We'll try something different then.
I want you all to put your mouth over the first three holes, more or less, doesn't matter, and inhale twice, right? Okay, someone over here has to turn theirs over. Someone's getting this. You want this. Okay, I won't look. Good. Okay, so now let's try to do it together. All right? On the count of three, we're gonna, I'm gonna go one, two, three, bop, hold on, bop, bop, okay? One, two, three. All right, that was, that was awesome. So let's try it again. On the count of three, one, two, three. You guys are amazing. I have never, how many people here, like 300? And we did it in the first try? Awesome, okay. So you know what happens, it's just like sales quotas. When you get it right, it gets harder. So now, now I want you to exhale, inhale, exhale. So on the count of three, you're gonna go exhale, Okay? Out, in, out. It's not that hard. <laughs> On the count of three. One, two, three. Oh, so close. Nah, we can do it. We can do better. Let's try again. On the count of three. One, two, three. Out, in, out. All right, that was awesome, good. You can applaud, come on. By the way, after this, you can go drink, so. All right, now, like sales quotas, once you can do it, it gets harder, so now we're gonna combine these. Inhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. In, in, out, in, out, on the count of three. Ready? One. All right, let's try that again. On the count of three. One, two, three. So close. On the count of three, let's try it again. In, in, out, in, out. One, two. You're like a rowdy bunch. Someone else want to come up here and do this? Feel free. Ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Very good. I'm going to ignore that solo down there. <laughs> Who wants to come up and play it for the crowd? <laughs> now, do you know? <laughs> well, here, go ahead. You can play it. But you notice, I said, who wants to come up and play? Everybody said Rafa. He didn't say he wanted to come up and play. <laughs> so you ready? On three, you know the music, right? Okay. Instrument up. Look at him. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> On three. One, two, three. <laughs> Who would you like to join you on stage? Who? Vessel. Did you want to come as well? Come on. Come on. Now, do you all want to play solo or do you want to do a trio? I'm Bruce. What is your name? Gerardo. Gerardo, nice to meet you. That's not fair. <laughs> What's not fair? You want to play by yourself? Okay. All right. <laughs> so, Gretchen, on three. Okay, on three. One, two, three. Yeah. Let's do it together. Don't leave, don't leave. And now we're gonna, now we'll have everyone play together, the three of you, okay, on three. One, two, three. Beautiful. Anybody else wanna join us? Come on. 
In this whole room, nobody wants to join Maru? us? Come on, Maru. <laughs> Come on. You got us on the stage, right? <laughs> yeah, it's her fault. The big fun part's coming. You sure you don't want to be up here? You get to be on video? Oh, we got the twofer. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, well, here. In, in, out, in, out. On three. One. Yeah, of course. You know what? Look at this. It's like a junior high school dance. The boys are on this side. The girls are on this side. The boys are all going. Come on. Make like you make believe you like it. I'll move the music. Make like you like each other. I'll move it in a second. Okay, can you see it? Yeah. On three. One, two, three. All right, everybody stand up, please. Can we turn the house lights up? Now, here's the amazing thing. Remember I told you I wanted you all to try something new? If I was going to say to you, you're going to learn to play a musical instrument, you would have thought I was crazy. But you can do it. If I would say to you, get up in front of your peers, your friends, your associates, and embarrass you, I mean, and play the instrument, you would have said I was crazy. You would have said WTF, right? But they're doing it. So now, if I were to say to you that you are now going to play harmonica, that's what this is called, by the way, with arguably the best rock and roll band in history, and by the way, I use the word arguably because I don't want to argue. If you think another band was better, it's OK with me. I can't tell you how many times I've done this and someone comes up to me and goes, they weren't the best. That's cool. It's all right. But if I had said to you, you're going to get up in front of your friends, play a musical instrument you've never played before with arguably the best rock and roll band in history, you would have said, repeat it all with me, please, W-T-F which stands for where's the future, and in one second, and I hope you're getting goosebumps, you are going to know where the future is. Uh, someone back there who's got the music cue, this is your cue, but one second, the introduction to the song is exactly this little ditty that I've taught you, and it comes around each time the music is repeated. I'll conduct it for you, we will all play together, okay? All right, whoever's got the music, loud and hit it.
Thank you very much. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. 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 Thank you.